the wife of Bath in the Canterbury Tales. Um, if you look at some of the building background on 124, um, it mentions here and there about, you know, women at times were considered inferior and so on. Now, remember, and hopefully when you went through this, you remembered how the wife of Bath, what her personality was like that we learned from the prologue. Okay? How she had a history with men. Okay? How she, um, well, five times married, right? How she was married five different times. How she liked to laugh and chat, and she knew all of love's mischance. She knew the remedies. She knew how to fix your love life. Kind of a, well, who do we say? Oprah? I like that. I wrote that down. That was good. Um, you know, somebody that likes to, uh, likes to help out, um, really more to hear herself talk probably, and for people to say, thank you, you're right, you're right, you're right, that type of thing. And so now we have on 125, um, <clears throat> excuse me, when it has italics and bolded, what that is doing is it, it was much larger in the original works, but they decide we don't need all that, so we're just kind of condensing it, Cliff Notes versioning it for you. Um, but it really explains a lot. Her tale doesn't start until the next page. Okay? And in fact, um, we learn a very important thing here about line three or four up there in the italics. Um, Apparently, the object of marriage for her is to have mastery over her husband. Okay, if you could write in your book, you should completely highlight that crazily. Okay, um, her purpose is to s prove that women want mastery over their husband, want to be in control, not equals, because remember, like I said, women were considered inferior. Okay? We don't just want to be equals, women. We want to be masters. We want to control them. Okay? And that's her ultimate goal. And just like the partner, he had an ultimate goal, an ultimate, uh, ultimate moral to his story, to his tale. And we saw that play out the way it did. And so here we're going to see um, a similar story as well. Um, at the bottom of 125, we see a lot of discussions back and forth. This isn't a tale. This is almost like between the scenes. If we are watching this as a big production where the partner's play is put on and then there's some in-between stuff that goes on and then the wife of Bass tale goes on. It's kind of like the in-between, the setting up. And you can see the partner sitting there talking to the wife of Bath, the wife of Bath talking to so-and-so and there are all of these other people. Um, and on the top of 126, uh, if you look at where the partner says, um, <clears throat> Madam, I put it to you as a prayer, the partner said, go on. As you began, tell us your tale and spare not for any man. Instruct us younger men in your technique. So please, go ahead. Enlighten me. Show me how women should or how women truly want to have mastery over their husband. I don't think it's going so far as to say I dare you or I double dog dare you. I don't think it's going that far. But yet it's like, all right, prove it. <laughs> We're not going anywhere. We got nothing better to do. Tell us your story. Um, so she goes on to talk about, before she even gets into her parable, her story, um, that middle section there in bold, it goes into detail about her life, her husband's. So in order to have her argument resonate and her moral resonate, they need to know where she's coming from. And so she instructs them about my marriages and how I mastered over them and how my husbands tried to break my will, but they couldn't, you know, th these type of things. Um, they didn't want me reading. They didn't want me to do these different things. But ultimately, I, I dominated and I won in my life. Um, um, bu -bu 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 um, the story takes place. King Arthur, Knights of the Round Table. When you think of King Arthur, you probably think of his sword, Excalibur. You may have heard of, you know, the musical Camelot. Um, you know, the, the Monty Python, uh, Search for the Holy Grail. Um, if the Disney fans in here, Sword in the Stone, um, that was young Arthur, um, and you saw him pulling the, the sword out there, um, and Merlin the Magician, and you know, all of that stuff. Um, this isn't about Arthur and his sword, this is more about his wife Guinevere, okay? Um, we have a knight on 127, a knight that did something inappropriately. There's a PowerPoint on Moodle. Um, right around this era uh, on Moodle or the Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, which is the next thing, uh, that deals with what the knight's responsibilities are. Knights are an extension of the king. If they do something inappropriately, 
people look at them and just, they don't go, oh, Sir Lancelot did something inappropriately. It is, oh, look at the representative of um, Arthur. And look what Arthur's crew is doing, right? Um, you know, if you read a, you know, a, a, any of the Star Wars books or comics, you know, when the stormtroopers do something bad, it's not just stormtroopers. Look at what the Empire is doing. It's what they represent. And so for knights, um, it is a lifelong, their school and their education is to be a knight. Their graduation from college is a knighthood, you know, where they bend down, they sword on each shoulder like Sir Shrek has happened to him, that type of thing. Um, and so we have these knights who live their life a certain way. Um, you know, they must be chaste. They must uh, treat women appropriately. The term chivalrous or chivalry uh, is from the knights. So if you see a gentleman open up a door for a lady or pull out a chair, people might say, oh, how chivalrous. Oh, how knightly they are. You know, they're treating women the way that they should be. Okay, so that's important to remember because this knight does something inappropriately on the next page. He takes the woman's maidenhead. What does that mean? Does it mean he cuts off her head? No. He takes her virginity. He rapes her. We all understand that rape's a pretty horrible thing. But now imagine a knight who is supposed to treat women well and be kind and be an extension of the king. Do you see how raping a young lady down by the river or by the lake is not very good? Okay. Um, you know, the, you know, Arthur and, and everybody, you know, that's condemning him to death. Okay. Um, if you look on the bottom of 127, the act of violence made such a stir, so much petitioning to the king for her, that he condemned the knight to lose his head. Of course, by course of law, he was as good as dead. But, line 70, here's an important thing. But that the queen and other ladies too implored the king to exercise his grace, so ceaselessly he gave the queen the case and granted her his life. And she could choose whether to show him mercy or refuse. So he went and raped a female, a woman. Probably a lot of women would be able to... Um, you know, feel for that woman and probably want to be in charge of taking care of, you know, the, not necessarily the execution, but a say in what happens. And so the queen, who, who ultimately had the power? Arthur. Who did he give it to? The woman. Can we already start to see the wife of Baths, you know, her influence in the story? Who's getting the ultimate choice on whether this male lives or dies, a woman, and was given to, that, that power was given to her by her husband, a man. Um, and so we start to see um, women having the power and so on. Um, line 80, she gives him a proposition. Yet you shall live if you can answer me. What is the thing that women most desire? Be where the acts and say as I require. She gives him an opportunity to redeem his life. I want you to tell me what women desire more than anything else. If you find out the answer, you will not be beheaded. You will survive and live. If you don't, you will die. You have one year from today. You have one year. Go figure it out and come back. Would you take that year or would you say, nah, just kill me now? Probably you would want to live. I would think. Now. Think about it. Would this be a stressful year for you guys? Knowing that that hourglass is running out and you can't find that answer because it's what women desire. It's what all women desire, that one thing. But the problem is I could ask each woman in here, what do they desire most? I doubt any of you will be even remotely close to agreeing. But I have to figure out what the one thing is. So do I take a little bit of what each one of you says, combine it, and roll it up into one, and then that's my answer? Because everybody had some influence in it. Probably not. And his life, I mean, this is, li <laughs> this is life or death. He has one shot. And so there would be a lot of pressure. Um, yeah, line 90, 91. And in the end, he chose to go away and to return after a year and a day, so a year and a day, 
armed with such answer as there might be sent to him by God, he took his leave and went. Um, as you look down, some of the things, he started asking women during his travels and he kept getting different answers, different answers. Um, some said that women wanted wealth and treasure. Honor, said some. Some, jollity and pleasure. Some, gorgeous clothes. And others, fun in bed. To be oft widowed and remarried, said others again. And some, that what most mattered, matters was that we should be cosseted and flattered. Okay, that's pretty much five or six different things. Some of them just want to have you know, great relations in bed with the man. Some want to be you know, widowed and remarried several, several times. Meaning they want, you know, as they get older, they want to keep younger men around. Some of them just want to be taken care of and flattered. You know, others just want, you know, pretty clothes. Others want, you know, a high standing and honor to be respected. So we have differences. Can you imagine the stress that this night is going under? Now, I don't think we should feel sorry for this rapist. But yet, I think we put that to the side and look at what his objective is and the struggles that must be going on in his mind to find that that uh, illicit answer and so on. Um, and then lastly, you know, down at the bottom, some say the things we most desire are these. Freedom to do exactly as we please with no one to reprove our faults and lies, rather to have one call us good and wise. So there's still some more things, some more things. And he struggles and struggles to find out exactly what that, uh, what that is. Um, Now, line 120, we like to be thought wise and void of sin. Uh, others assert we women find it sweet when we are thought dependable, discreet, and secret, firm of purpose and controlled, never betraying things. So we want to be trustworthy. We want people to think that their secrets are safe with us. These are all different things. These are all wonderful things. Women, you should be able to have whatever you want. But for a man who has to come up with one answer, this is very difficult. And the, there's a story about the man with the ears, the deformity. He whispers to his, or he tells his wife, you know, don't tell anybody about my, my deformity. And she just, in this story, she's just bursting, so she has to tell somebody. So she goes down to the water, and she just whispers. She just whispers because she has to say something. She just has to let it out. But the wind picks it up. And it gets louder and carries away. And she was unable to keep that secret. So women want to be not remembered for this example in the story, the, the Ovid story. We want to be remembered that we can keep a secret and be trustworthy to, with our mates and so on. Um, so if you were getting lost about, wait a minute, what's this deformity thing? It's not a big premise of the whole piece. It's just to reiterate uh, the woman's desire to be trustworthy and so on. Um, and that's where 130 kind of wraps that up. Uh, 131, we get a little supernatural. He's out walking. He's starting to run out of time. And he saw a dance upon the leafy floor of four and twenty ladies, nay and more. Eagerly, he approached in hope to learn some words of wisdom ere he should return. So he's like, oh, this is rough. Oh, wow, well, there's 24 women dancing over there. Let's go talk to them. Maybe I can find my answer. Normally, I have to talk to one at a time. But... There's a whole score of ladies over here. Let's go talk to them. Uh, but lo, before he came to where they were, dancers and dance all vanished into the air. There wasn't a living creature to be seen save one old woman crouched upon the green. A fouler looking creature, I suppose, could scarcely be imagined. She arose and said, Sir Knight, there's no way on from here. Tell me what you are looking for, my dear, for a peradventure that were best for you. We old, old women know a thing or two. Tell me, what troubles you? Why did you come here? I'm being an old, old woman, and is she attractive? He said, you couldn't hardly imagine somebody more ugly, fouler. I've been around the block a little bit. Tell me, what problems do you have? What can I, how can I help you? How can I help you? Dear madam, I am as good as dead. If I can't say what thing is it that women most desire, if you could tell me, I would pay your hire. Give me your hand, she said, and swear to do whatever I shall next require of you. So she knows the answer. He's pleased by this. But she says, I will help you. You don't have to pay me like you offered. But you must give me a favor when I ask of it. You must do what I say when I ask of it. 
Think about it from the nice point of view. Do this open-ended promise or die? Open-ended promise, OK? But we all know from movies and books and TV shows that that's usually not going to turn out well, is it? Don't you always need to know exactly what it is that you're agreeing to? I would hope so. So um, page 150, 130, is that 32? 132, he takes her back to the court. His time is up. Shows up with Guinevere. He walks out. If you look, my liege and lady in general, said he, and here's what he found out. A woman wants the self-same sovereignty over her husband's as over her lover and master him. He must not be above her. That is your greatest wish. Whether you kill or spare me, please yourself, I wait you will. So that's my answer. That's my answer. In all the court, not one that shook her head or contradicted what the knight had said. Maid, wife, widow, cried. He saved his life. Good answer. He probably already talked to each of these ladies throughout the year. And they all told him something different. These might be the women that we quoted a couple pages ago. But now when they hear that this is the ultimate, like, yeah, I like that answer better. We'll go with that answer. I like that one. He saved his life. Good answer. Good answer because all women want that. You don't want to be treated less than a man. Don't you want to be at minimum the equal? But wouldn't you really like to have that power? Wouldn't you like to have that mastery and that control? Take out the trash. I don't want to. Take it out. Okay. You know, don't you want that? I would think so. I would think so. Um, it comes out that uh, the old lady comes out, the, the fouler creature, line 226. Twas I who taught this answer to the knight for which he swore and pledged his honor to it, that the first thing I asked of him, he do it, so far as it should lie within his might. So before this court, I ask you then, sir knight, to keep your word. Ah, and take me for your wife. For well you know that I have saved your life. If this be false, deny it on your sword. So she comes out in front of everybody and says, he swore honor. As a knight, you swear your honor. Your, your, you swear everything to the, to the king, to your sword. I mean, back then, guys, they named their swords. Okay, I know Middle Earth and Lord of the Rings wasn't exactly in this era, but they named all weapons back then. And the Anglo-Saxons and the Vikings and Beowulf stuff, they named their weapons. Beowulf, they named their weapons. Okay, those things were passed down from generation to generation. It is an honorable thing to have and hold. And so she says, swear it on your sword if I lie. And so that would be like a double <laughs> condemning him. So he can't do that. And so for the honor of Arthur and the knight and his promise, he decides to marry her. Happily? No. What does he think about her? Yes, you saved my life. Is he attracted to her? No. She's so old, a fouler creature he couldn't imagine. So whatever you have a vision of ugly in your mind for the opposite sex, compound that. Compound it. Keep going. I mean, I think that's what we got to think of to get in the mind of this night. It's horrible. And so they get married in a big, beautiful wedding, lavish ceremony. No, 133. <coughs> I say there was no joy or feast at all. Nothing but heaviness of heart and sorrow. At a wedding? Heaviness of heart and sorrow. He married her in private on the morrow and all day long stayed hidden like an owl. It was such torture that his wife looked foul. So torture that his wife looked so ugly that he was married to her, that he was not attracted to her. Well, we saw what happened to the last lady that he was attracted to. So I don't think we really feel sorry for him, right? I think if you would keep this in perspective. But yet, it's, I find this a kind of a comical um, scenario because typically you've seen in movies, you know, the, uh, you know, you get married. You go to the honeymoon, or you have the night of the wedding, where there's certain practices that usually are undertaken or performed. And so we have this gentleman who's married, and you think he's excited about all of that? Question mark. 
Probably not. And so it's kind of funny here, these lines. Um, Great was the anguish churning in his head when he and she were piloted to bed. So they were going to be husband and wife for the first time. But the anguish was churning in his head. Migraines, just it was horrible. He wallowed back and forth in desperate style. His ancient wife lay smiling all the while. At last she said, bless us. Is this, my dear, how knights and wives get on together here? Are these the laws of good King Arthur's house? Are knights of his also contemptuous? I am your own beloved and your wife, and I am she indeed that saved your life, and certainly I never did you wrong. He wasn't excited about it. She's sitting there smiling, ready to have a good time, and he's just not having a good time. And she's like, dude, I'm your wife. Are all knights? I, I expected to marry her tonight. I thought this was going to be like, hey, 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 big deal. This was going to, you know, be awesome. But no, it's pretty horrible. Why? What have I done to you? I've done the one thing that no other woman can do. I saved your life. And how are you behaving? Why are you treating me this way? And it goes on for a couple pages. They go back and forth where he's just unhappy. And we know why. But yet we see her struggling with it because I don't understand. How can you despise me so much? How can you not love me for the person I am? You know the whole thing, inner beauty, right? Uh, you know, love the person inside, not outside. I mean, all that stuff. And so that's discussed up and down uh, these, after these two pages. Um, page 137. She gives him an opportunity or an option here to, uh, to rectify the situation. She's going to give him the choice. The woman is going to give the man the choice. She says, listen, here's the thing. I want this to work out. I want our marriage to work out. So here's the deal. I stay exactly like I am. And I will be the most loyal wife you will ever have. I will be the best wife in the world. Or I could be a knockout. I could be the hottest thing that you know, you've ever seen. But I, I, I can't guarantee that I'll be loyal. I can't guarantee I'll be a good wife. Your friends will come to see me and you won't even be around, more than likely. Okay, so ugly and good wife or hot and a horrible wife? You choose. So the woman gave the man the choice. Um, and that's there on 137, around uh, line 395, and so on. Uh, down at 405, at last he said, with all the care in life, my lady and my love, my dearest wife, I leave the matter to your wise decision. You make the choice yourself for the provision of what may be agreeable and rich in honor to us both. I don't care which. Whatever pleases you suffices me. So she gives him the power, and what does he do with it? Gives it right back. You make the choice. You make whatever you feel is right. You, feel, you make whatever you feel is right for both of us, and I will be content with that. So he's been broken down over these two pages that we've you know, where it was back and forth, back and forth. You know, she at one point was like, you know, you were born into your greatness. You know, don't think you're any better than me. You were born, your family conceived you. You were privileged. You didn't have to do anything. Okay, so, I mean, he was knocked down a peg or two. And so we have here at the bottom 137. Here's where it comes out. Ah, and have I won the mastery, said she? Since I'm to choose and rule as I think fit, Certainly, wife, he answered. That's it. Kiss me, she cried. No quarrels on my oath and word of honor. You shall find me both. That is, both fair and faithful as a wife. So wait a minute. That's ultimately what she wanted, was mastery over her husband. As we saw the very first lines of this tale, as we know from what the wife of Bath, her personality and what the moral ultimately was going to be. And so this woman says, you won. Oh, excuse me. She says, I won. So I will be both. I will be as faithful to you and the best wife possible. But for you, I will be beautiful. And she transforms herself into the most beautiful goddess. And then that's 
ultimately how it ends. Um, if you look at the bottom, that last, uh, last stanza there. Um, so they lived ever after to the end in perfect bliss. And may Christ Jesus send us husbands, meek and young and fresh in bed, and grace to overbid them when we wed. And Jesu, hear my prayer. Cut short the lives of those who won't be governed by their wives and all old angry niggards of their pence. God send them soon a very pestilence. So these husbands that don't allow us to be, uh, to, to, um, to dominate them, go ahead and cut their lives short. And we want to marry young, good men in bed and all these things. So we see the moral kind of come out here in the end where it's really kind of a woman's power woman's lib type thing here. Um, a lot of times we talk after this piece, um, was justice served? When you make a mistake at home, maybe you were expecting punishment, but maybe your parents wanted to teach you a lesson. And so you had to learn something or learn from your mistake. And hopefully you're wiser at the end, right? Did this guy learn? It looks like he learned the ultimate goal and the lesson, and he truly believed and truly gave that mastery to the woman over him. Do you think it's fair that he lives happily ever after with a knockout wife, the best wife in the world? Who is that not fair for? Do you remember the little girl that got raped? You kind of forget about her, don't you? You know what I mean? I mean, that, it, I don't, it's not meant to be a story about her. It's supposed to be a moral of the tale and women mastery. And, of course, I guess you got the casualty of war there with, with, the, with the young lady. But it's just one of those things that every once in a while somebody goes, wait a minute. He kind of made out like a bandit at the end. Yeah, he had a year thinking he was going to die. and he had, I mean, so he learned from his mistakes. He was reformed. So it's like he served his prison sentence on death row, but then he was released. And he is a better person. He has been rehabilitated. So if you want to think about that, yes, he's been rehabilitated. But I guess the victims never truly get saved or recovered to some degree. Um, so it's, uh, that's just some, some little side thing that we usually talk about that it's, uh, it's kind of interesting and so on. Uh